Welcome to Koshitse 2.0 series, a series focused on citizen experience, public services, decision-making based on data, improvement of well-being, and last but not least, on the growth of civic engagement. On today's episode, we'll discuss how to measure citizens' well-being. What makes a city a great place from the citizens' perspective? Charles Landry, a leading voice on urban change, guides us through some measures of citizens' well-being. What Anchorage means simply is what is familiar to me. Who do I know? My family, my friends, the wider networks and so on. So that's the sort of people side of it. But the other side is also the built fabric, which may be the heritage. And all of these things like heritage speaks to the past of a place and gives some people some sense of, I come from somewhere. And when cities work well, people like what they've got, or at least they acknowledge it. They might not like every aspect of their history, but at least they know this is me. First of, the idea of Anchorage. Austrian architect Gabu Hendel also relates the sense of citizen well-being with the idea of belonging. In particular, the value of not having existential threats when it comes to living in the city. Unfortunately, our cities at this moment are really facing a serious housing crisis, maybe also a crisis of public space. But especially when it comes to the affordance of housing, I would say that it really um, we are really to work very hard to make sure that nobody actually feels existentially endangered in threats of not being able to afford housing anymore, which gives enormous pressure to people. At the end of the day, it also means, um, can you afford, can you find housing that suits your needs? How do I want to live together? With whom? Not everybody wants to live in a small unit, but maybe live collectively, but doesn't find the place. Live in a certain place rather than another, but doesn't find housing there. This is where, like, uh, working on the freedom of, um, the right to housing is, uh, yeah, a big, t- a big task and important one. We return to Charles Landry to discuss the importance of opportunity within our cities. And this is all about, at one level, job opportunities, um, perhaps the openness of a place that allows people not to have barriers and feel constrained by interests and so on. So if you come from a more impoverished background, you can still make the most of your life. It's not all about secret networks and only those people get the big jobs and the interesting jobs. In 2012, Gimaris was selected as European Capital of Culture. Carlos Martins tells us about the importance of opportunity and retaining talent in the city. For instance, the university opened the design center at that time. They start new design uh, um, uh, degrees and the city understood the importance of design, special linking with textile and more traditional companies, but also connecting with art and, and, and creativity. The, um, the objective of producing economic value and retaining talent, I would say, was central to this discussion. And at the end of the day, uh, more than um, 1,000 permanent jobs were produced through ECOC. Um, the economic the, uh, um, turnover of the program was more than 100 million euros, and the city was different after the ECOC process and, st- and keep being different every day, but especially this connection between um, uh, culture, economic system and university, it was, re- I would say, redesigned. For Charles Landry, it is also equally important that cities provide a sense of inspiration. And as you know, uh, people often call museums the cathedrals of the post-industrial age or art galleries. So it can be an institution, and particularly the programming of that cultural institution, that can provide inspiration. But other things can provide inspiration too, which might be an event, a festival, or something like that, which brings you together, where you perhaps even sing together, where you feel at one, and this feeling at one with all the other people are there gives you some sense that I am part of a larger whole. 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, artist Dane Rosengard developed a project called Urban Sun, a project designed to bring well-being to public spaces. Well, I think I think the well-being is a really important theme, especially in a COVID time like this. I mean, it's nice that you have money on the bank, but yeah, if you can't travel and if you're stuck, like, um, so uh, I think that was one of the reasons why we started Urban Sun, um, which uses a, a special new safe far UVC light to sanitize public spaces of, of, of COVID-19 and, and other viruses. And this was a really beautiful way of indeed trying to say, hey, how can we combine art and science um, to bring well-being? And it was so cool to sort of um, put that human well-being central and then start thinking, okay, but so what, what you know, I'm not, I'm not a vaccine expert. Huh? I can't design a vaccine or I'm not a virus. So, but you're always trying to think, okay, what can I do as a designer, as a creator? Professor of Cultural Economics, Pierre Luigi Sacco, gives the example of the role music had during the pandemic on generating citizens' well-being. Think of what happened, for example, during the pandemic. The role that music had in uh, helping us keep our mental sanity, not uh, incidentally, of course, there was a boom in demand of online stream music. And uh, at the same time, we know that, for example, music literally has a, a cannabinoid effect. It releases endorphins, literally. We feel better when we listen to music. We need less opioids, for example, in a post-surgical treatment. So the point is that this relationship seems to be linked to the fact that culture is important for human survival in ways that we did not suspect. Designer and innovation specialist Michaela Magas questions the frame in which we measure well-being and the need to extend it to a broader spectrum of activity to capture it. Brain-computer interfaces are placing us as human beings uh, some great new challenges, but also are highlighting the plasticity of the human mind and how quickly a human can adapt. Um, in our case, in our experiments, it has actually shown that in terms of health and well-being, we actually need to reframe our notion of ability in the context of these new systems. Because what we have found is that people who were previously uh, categorized as disabled in the mechanical era because of the tools that they had available to them are now in the era of brain-computer interfaces far more talented uh, than the rest of us. Now this is a huge shift in paradigm and perception and highlights some of the issues with categorizing people, um, placing people into categories which inherently creates bias. The moment you create a category, that means that you create bias. And we really question as a result our mental models, our mental models about how we manage um, uh, our relationship with technology as humans, how we manage our relationship as humans with uh, our environment and our ecosystems, all of that really affects ultimately our health and well-being. According to what we've heard, the creativity has an impact on many different levels. It has an influence on the society, psychology, economical value, innovations. But for what's more important, it's essential to discuss the policies that are dealing with the issues of citizens' engagement, housing, or people's bond with a specific place. We will be following this in the next episode and discuss how data can better inform policies.